So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, correct and secure compilation for multi-language software over these four lectures. So now my goal for these lectures is to kind of give you, um, you know, the 30,000 foot view of the entire space of compiler correctness and then zoom in into some pieces of work and try to tell you things that you can't find written down in the papers. All right? Um, and I'm going to try to intersperse this with a few sort of proper technical exercises where we take one sample compiler path and we try to use the techniques that we've learned, you know, whether they're things like logical relations or um, other things um, like how do we reason about languages when we mix them together, which you were just talking to Ron about a little bit, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to then show you, you know, how you take these actual technical things that you've been hearing and learning about and use them to do compiler correctness proofs so that we can um, start to build up techniques that are you know, useful for practical compilers that we'd like to be able to use for compiler verification of realistic compilers. That's the overall theme. All right? OK. So and please ask questions as we go along. Um, all right. So let me just sort of start at a very, very high level. We want to prove compiler correctness. What does that mean? All right, well, if we have a source program S that we compile to a target program T, and by the way, throughout my slides, when you see S, think source language. When you see T, think target language, all right? Um, so if I have S and it compiles to T, which is my squiggly arrow there, then basically what we're trying to prove in a nutshell is that S and T somehow have the same behavior, all right? And now the question all becomes, how do we say that they have the same behavior? Right? How do we actually formally express that so that we can prove it? Right? And that's really what compiler verification is about. Now, let's be a little bit more precise. Throughout the literature, when we talk to each other in the community, we always say compiler correctness or compiler verification. But technically, what we're trying to prove when we say compiler correctness, we are trying to prove that the compiler preserves semantics. Is semantics preserving? Right? And even that has many, many layers that you have to sort of peel away to actually understand what it is we're proving, but for now, we'll stay here. All right? So intuitively, we want to prove that the compiler is semantics preserving. That means that whatever the sort of semantics or operational behavior is when we run S, we want that to be preserved when we run T. So if we run S and we see certain observations, like you know, something getting printing at, printed out to the screen, um, we want to see the same observations when we run the compiled version of that. Right? So already in what I'm saying, there's something implicit in this theorem, which is that when we formally say what it means for S and T to have the same behavior, for them to be equivalent, we are saying that, oh, in the process of doing this, we're going to take the source language S, and we're going to formally write down its operational semantics. What is it that happens when we run these programs? What are the outputs that we see? And we're also saying we're going to take the target language and formally write down, specify its, op its operational semantics. And then what we're trying to do is say, when we run the S program according to S operational semantics and the T program according to the target uh, operational semantics, what we see out of both runs are the same observables. Right? OK. I'm trying to sort of say rather obvious things right now, but just to bring them out that this is, these are the things that we assume we can rely on. In a sense, though, when I say we're going to formalize the source and target operational semantics, we're saying we'll trust them. We'll formalize them. We'll trust them. And then we know what the theorem means. OK? All right. Now, a lot of the time I'm going to be talking about compiler correctness. But there really is, there, there's a wide range of compiler properties that we might be interested in. And um, you know, it, it helps to sort of know what came before sort of the most recent decade of work on compiler verification and, you know, what are other properties that we've been interested in and might be interested in, in the future. So here, here are the ones I'm going to try to touch upon. So in the 90s, there was a lot of work on type preserving compilation. Now, you guys have been learning a lot about types um, over the past couple of weeks, right? Um, we have nice, strongly typed languages out there like ML, uh, Java, et cetera, right? These give us very nice properties. They tell us things about, oh, you're going to not have certain um, you know, type uh, and me memory. Basically, they give you type and memory safety kinds of properties. right? Um, so the work in the 90s was trying to say, well, if you have a strongly typed and therefore safe um, source programming language, let's take ML, and then you compile it down to a target language, why is it that we just type check the source program and throw away the types? Why is that a good idea? Let's try and keep some of this information around as we compile into, as we take the high level 
language program and transform it into lower and lower and lower le level language programs, right? So this was the famous work, um, line of work that went from uh, you know, ML-like languages, the, the paper called System F to Typed Assembly Language, which shows you how to go from an ML-like language all the way down to a Typed Assembly Language. All right, now the big buzz in the 90s, it's always interesting to see how are people pitching their research in a certain era. All right, and I wanna talk about that on and off throughout the next four lectures. All right, it, the big buzz in the 90s was, um, look, this is really nice, we can debug our compilers. <laughs> Okay, because compilers are these massive pieces of software. Um, if you are actually preserving type annotations, then what, you, what that means is that when you get your compiler's output, you can at least type check it. And if it doesn't type check, you can find very obvious compiler errors. Right? This was, this was you know, really nice. Um, but that wasn't, I mean, a little bit flippant. That wasn't the only reason that that was, you know, um, very nice um, as a sort of motivation perhaps practical compiler writers. The other motivation was that types tell us properties of programs. Han was just talking about this, right? A type system is another language, tells you it, but it says something about the behavior or the properties of the, the, uh, the term language, right? So these types tell you properties of programs, and when you have this extra information about perhaps the behavior of programs, then perhaps you can use that extra information in order to try to do optimization. So that was the other, op other motivation. Um, and we can come back to, you know, some of that was true, but um, some of it, it, it becomes difficult. There's also sort of the additional problem of having a lot of type annotations at the target level. You know, there's, uh, they grow in size and so on. Um, but we'll come back to some of these issues. All right, and then there's all the work on semantic preserving compilation. And really, you know, in a, this started out um, well, really, people have been talking about compiler verification for over 40 years now. I think it's been about 45 years since a uh, seminal paper by McCarthy. Um, but the way that we all hear about compiler correctness, all of you have heard about CompCert, right? Have you? CompCert, C compiler, formally, fully formally verified C compiler, yes. All right, so the first CompCert paper was written in 2006. And, you know, since then, there's really been a ton of follow-up work. All right, so that's why I've sort of written uh, the 2000s. Um, and again, I've already said semantics preserving compilation refers to correct compilation. Now, before I go on and talk about other compiler properties, let me ask you a question. So I'm telling you that semantics preserving compilation is, pres is about preserving the observable behavior of a program. So we know that it's correct. And I'm telling you that type preserving compilation is about preserving just certain safety properties and so on, right? Preserving type is about preserving I don't know, checking that the target programs that we produce have the type check, therefore they have whatever type we say they have. So if you are building a correct compiler, would you also want it to be type preserving or do you think one subsumes the other? <sighs> Should it? The answer could be a wide range of things. It sort of depends on what is it that the types tell you about the behavior of programs. Right? So let's step back and think about that for a second. Um, so type preserving compilation is saying that if I have a source program which I'll write as ES, whose type is some source type tau S, right? And I compile it to some target program ET, then type preserving compilation says, oh, you know, the compiler is going to take all these source level type annotations and transform them somehow into the appropriate low level annotations. So a function, if this was a function, tau1 to tau2, by the time we get to assembly, the type that we will have sitting over here, which I'll write as tau s plus, some translation of the source type, um, that type will say, will somewhere in there essentially capture the fact that what we've produced is a function. But now it won't look like a high level function. It'll look like um, a bunch of basic blocks, right? When you jump to the very first basic block, you have to provide in a register perhaps an argument of type tau1, right? If your source program was tau1 to tau2, then over here, the code that we're gonna produce is going to be a bunch of basic blocks. When you jump to the first, the first of these basic blocks, when you start the function, you have to provide an argument of the type of some translation of tau1, perhaps in a register, perhaps sitting somewhere on the heap, right? So we can start to capture the high level invariance or assumptions about what our programs do, for instance, if this was tau1 arrow tau2, in, in terms of very low level um, 
specifications, if you will. Okay? So that's really what type preserving compilation is all about. All right, so now back to my question, which was when types, what do types tell you about the behavior of programs? This is just one thing, right? But you guys have been learning about things like polymorphism and existential types, right? And uh, I think that you have heard about parametricity over the course of this lecture, right? Okay, so parametricity, representation independence. What do, what do these things, what do um, universal types or polymorphism and existential types tell us about programs? If I have a source level program and it has our classic favorite polymorphic type for all alpha, alpha or alpha, what do I know about it? Why is it the identity function? Because you can't inspect the alphas. All right. And how do we reason about this kind of behavior? So let's say I know that this is the polymorphic identity function in the source language. And now I compile it down to the target. Is it still the polymorphic identity function? Is it still polymorphic? How do you know that assembly code won't actually look at whatever we pass in for this argument? How do you prove that it won't look at it? What I'm trying to get at is that types often give us guarantees not just about a single run of a program, which is normally what we think of as safety, but they also often give us guarantees about two runs of a program. Things like parametricity and the free theorem, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that this is always going to behave like the polymorphic identity function is a free theorem. These, these properties um, that fall out of um, type, you know, type abstraction and existential types. Um, for instance, there's the famous phrase. Um, uh, okay, wait. <laughs> Did anyone talk about representation independence at the summer school in the last two weeks? No. Yes? No? Not really? <laughs> Ron's like, no. Okay, all right, let's, let's pause for a second and talk about representation independence. So you have seen existential types, right? I can't find an eraser. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's <That's> very observant. <laughs> um, if so. Um, if we have an expression where the type exists alpha tau, um, now existential types can be used to represent, uh, can be used to encode interfaces. So in, for instance, I could write down a, a, the type, an interface for a stack, right? So I could say there exists an alpha, which in my mind is the representation of a stack, um, such that I have a push, you know, a push and a pop method um, the, that, you know, uh, deal with this representation of the stack. And behind the stack interface, I can hide the concrete representation of the stack, right? Now, what that means is that you are free to go implement this interface in different ways. You can write down one implementation which concretely represents the stack using an array. You can write another implementation that concretely represents the stack using a linked list, right? And when your client tries to deal with your stack, as long as your client is okay with deal with, you know, as long as your client says, I agree to respect the stack interface, that means that they will not be able to see whether you implemented the stack as an array or as a, or as a linked list, right? This property is called representation independence. And it's due to the fact that we are saying there exists an alpha, let's call it alpha stack, there exists some type that represents the, con the concrete stack, but I'm going to keep it abstract and I'm going to keep it hidden from you, my client. That means you'll never be able to know. And that means, that gives us very nice software engineering advantages, right? Uh, because we can replace one implementation of the stack with another and the rest of our large software system, which was dealing with only the interface and promising to not look under the hood of the implementation, all of that remains unchanged and continues to work. All right? Okay. But this idea of representation independence, that these two implementations of the stack interface are equivalent, and therefore I can replace one with the other, this is a, an equivalence property, right? And these kinds of equivalence properties, or relational properties, where you talk about not just behavior of one single program, but behavior of two different programs relative to each other, or equivalence classes of, of programs, if you will. These are also guarantees that we get out of types, okay? And classic ones are parametricity and representation independence. 
Okay, so now back to this. If I build a semantics preserving compiler and it's correct, if I erase all of the types, then what I'm doing is I'm erasing types like those ones as well, universal types and existential types that, uh, that exist in my source language. If I erase all of those types, so I have now erased the stack interface, I've just taken the stack implementation and I'm going to compile it down to target, what's to say that some code that I link with later is not actually going to go and inspect whether my stack is an array or a linked list? I have no way of checking that whether it will or will not, right? So types tell us more than just about whether something runs correctly. Types tell us something about equivalent classes of programs when we take a component and embed it into a much larger software system. All right? So what I'm trying to get at is just building correct compilers, assuming you know, they're correct compilers that erase the types and then preserve the observable behavior of your source program, is not, um, does not mean that you don't get, you know, uh, that you don't need also type preserving compilation, which can somehow preserve the specifications or the interfaces that you had, the ha had at the high level all the way down to the low so that you can do some more checking there. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, let's say I have two different implementations. Yeah. One that uses only box types, so everything is pointer, mm -hmm. and one that also is allowed to put things on the stack. Like if I have a pair, it um, uses up more space. Okay. Now if I, in the box, the same code of the identical function, actually the same code works for all types. Yeah. But um, the unlocked version is for different size arguments. I need different actually generated functions. Yes. So which of these two implementations uh, would still be type preserving or semantic preserving? Uh, so well, it depends on how you want to engineer things, right? So. Uh, Part of your question, I'm assuming you're saying is that at the high level, we are using and in, you know, we're essentially hiding the fact that one is using a box type and the other one isn't, right? Um, so then it's, it's an implementation issue, like how does this play out? Um, so things like boxing are a problem because you'd have to, you know, in terms of now the practical or performance issues when, that come up when you, when you build compilers. Um, Whenever you have an indirect reference to something, you pay an extra, you pay extra cost, right? So this is something that has been an issue um, where you know, you'd like to be able to optimize that away. But anyway, that's a little bit of a digression. Um, your question was, which one of these, can you, can you say what exactly you're asking? Would still, um, would still have these properties of type pre preserving compilation or semantic? So you could build a type preserving compiler that if you're keeping the, the representation hidden at the source level, whether it's boxed or not, um, you can build a type preserving compiler that keeps that hidden all the way down to the target. Mm -hmm. And the key would be that you know, if you have something that's being hidden by an existential type, you, as you transform, you keep hiding it using an existential type. Okay? And we'll come back to this later as we talk more about it. Um, yeah. This will become clearer by like lecture three when you start to talk about sort of benefits. I, of I, I didn't understand. Yeah. The, the code generator has to inspect the argument and do something differently depending on the type. Yes. So yes. In, in which sense is it still like for all quantified? Um, I would have to show you the actual type to, to show that. So let me come back to that when we built up a bit more. Okay. okay? Um, yes. Um, well, one of our That are not what? That are not that much related at all between them. So different dynamics for special types, like where you have functions. Oh, so are you talking about programming languages with very different type systems? Something like that. I mean, if you, for example, want to compile a program that has special types into some sort of uh, lack of types with a special uh -huh. algorithm, for example. Yeah. So what do you do with those kind of types? Because they do not. You have to think very, very hard. You have, if you're going to take, <laughs> I mean that, you have to do that in compiler verification, especially if you're preserving types. So I wasn't being flippant. <laughs> um, you have to think about how, you have to think about what types mean in the session type language, all right? What are the behavioral properties that they are capturing? And then if you're transforming that language into a lower level language or lambda calculus or something, right? You have to think about how do I still faithfully capture those behaviors, but this time in a type system that is native to this new language. It's a matter of sort of encoding. 
but it's a matter of preserving, you know, equivalence classes of behavior as you go from, like there's one type in the source and it says, oh yeah, all of these things, you know, are equivalent at this type, all right? And then as you compile, you want to pick the right type so that you can preserve those properties. You can preserve the behavioral properties, right? This is what Ron was trying to get at. What, what do we know? Th these types tell us something about the behavior of programs. What is the right type in the other language that captures that same intuitive idea of behavior? And of course, we don't just want intuition. We can formally say these things, but we'll, we need to build up more to get there. OK? All right. Um, OK, so semantics preserving correct compilation. Now, um, all of this discussion was sort of my lead into this next property, that compilers don't, you don't just have to build type preserving compilers, or not, um, or correct compilers. There's an additional property that we might be interested in, which is fully abstract compilation. How many people have heard of fully abstract compilation? Okay, my students didn't bother to put their hands up. <laughs> okay, so fully abstract compilation is a property that, so here I showed you, um, so this was type preserving compilation. If a source program has type tau s, you compile it, it has some translation, some type that's the translation of that source type. And we've talked about semantics preserving, which is that if ES compiles to ET, so if that's the case, then that implies that they are somehow equivalent. Now, there's a third property. Let's call it equivalence preserving for starters, which is that if I have two source programs and they are equivalent, think back to my two implementations of the stack. So I have an ES1, and in my source language, I'll write S here, it is equivalent to ES2 at some appropriate type. Read this as stack implementation using the array, stack implementation using the linked list. They happen to be equivalent, and I can prove it using some technique, um, at the stack interface type. This is a good thing, right? We want this in our systems, in our software, when we build these things, so that we can replace one implementation with the other, right? Okay. So I want my compiler to preserve this property. I want my compiler, when I compile ES1 to, let's say, ET1, and I compile ES2 to ET2, I would like it to be the case, I would like this really strong property, that they are still equivalent in the target language at the appropriately translated type. So this somehow encodes that same stack interface, but you know, at the assembly level, perhaps. What does that mean? Or why would you want it? Yes? Uh, so why did the semantics preserving compilation not give you that? Good question. Um, suppose that I do this. Um, so I have two stack implementations. Let, let me just, I'll give you the simplest example, which is suppose that my compiler erases type. OK? All right. So my compiler erases types. <coughs> during compilation. Now, here's what we're doing. Um, in our source language, let's say it's ML, um, we know that these two stack implementations, I'm gonna keep pointing to them as if they're stack implementations, are equivalent at a stack interface type. Okay, that means that the type system is giving you a guarantee that when you come in, you can replace one implementation of the stack interface with another, and the rest of the software system remains unchanged. No bugs will be introduced by this change. Now, you compile one of these implementations down to this, okay? And you link with a client, right? It was a stack interface, so this is a stack implementation. Some, some other part of your software system is going to use it. Now you link with a client. Well, first question is, where is that client code coming from? Well, maybe some, someone, let's take the worst case scenario. Someone wrote some code in assembly <laughs> And you know, it wants to do something really malicious. So certainly this, this code, which is now not agreeing to abide by any interface, right? I erased that th stack interface representation from here. So there's nothing about types here. There are no alphas, is my point, to hide the fact that one stack is implemented as an array and the other one's implemented as a linked list, right? OK, so suddenly, when I take this piece of code and link it with some tar other target code, that target code could 
very well go in and look at what my representation of the stack is. Which means that when I replace the array implementation later on with the stack with the linked list implementation, that attacker or that client code, but which is now at the target level, at the assembly level, can also read, can figure out that this is not that and do something different. So suddenly, two things that were completely indistinguishable at the source level are no longer indistinguishable at the target level. Yes? But <coughs> when you say that these are indistinguishable at the source level, uh -huh. that's with respect to a client that shares the same guarantees, right? So the client is also getting type checked, but it's expecting it. Right? Yes. So, uh, and source then client. And then once they compile, it says now with a malicious client who has no guarantees. Yeah. So could, couldn't you say the same thing about the client and source language? You know, if I just write some program that's not going to do type checking against the interface, uh -huh. of course I can distinguish whether one is a stack or not. Exactly. So then it becomes a question of when you implemented your stack, um, when you had a stack interface and you implemented the stack two different ways, what were you, you the programmer, thinking? And I really want to sort of dwell on this question a lot over the next four days. Like, what is the programmer thinking when they, when they replace one implementation of a stack with another, assuming that they are working in a typed, strongly typed language, programming language, which gives you these guarantees? What do they want from the compiler is my question. So aren't they thinking that I'm going to, I can replace one implementation with another because my type system tells me that my clients will abide by this interface? Right, so they're not thinking that I'm going to link these implementations with arbitrary code that does not type check. Am I right there? I mean, let's come to agreement on that, right? It's a very important thing to note. What is your programmer thinking? Because I'd like to build compilers that are good for programmers so that they don't have to like, you know, struggle with weird errors that couldn't possibly have crept up in their source language. <coughs> okay? So, if that is the case, your source programmer is writing code in a type-safe language. Um, they are writing, they, they might be writing very, very secure implementations of components, but under the assumption that I only have to guard myself or I only have to check my inputs to make sure they, they don't do X, Y, and Z because my type system guarantees that they can't do this other thing. W or whatever, you know, which is going to be horrible because that just wouldn't type check. And now you take that code and you compile it into assembly. What about preserving the programmer's expectation? So that is what fully abstract compilation is. In a sense, it preserves the programmer's expectation. It gives you the guarantee that if you are doing reasoning at the source level where you are taking, in particular, it's most interesting when you have nice, strong type guarantees at your source level, if you are doing reasoning at, in your source programming language, relying on the guarantees that your type system gives you, it would be nice if we could then preserve those guarantees all the way down to the target. And technically speaking, fully abstract compilation gives you that. It says that if two, um, if two components, I'll say components because this is, my example actually doesn't really, I, if, I, if I can't link with clients, if these are not components of their whole program, then this property is utterly uh, uninteresting. Okay? We'll come back to that. But if, the, if I have two different components that are equivalent in the source language, and I can reason about their equivalence, and the type system helps me reason about this, um, I would like it to be the case that when I compile those components down to the target level, and I put them inside some, in the middle of some assembly code, I link them with some target context, think attackers. I would like it to be the case that they cannot inspect things that fall outside my mental model of what source context can expect, or can inspect. Does that make sense? I don't want to link with target clients that do bad things that no source client could have done because when I was writing this code, I was thinking of source client. Okay? So, um, so this is a matter of equivalence preserving compilation and when you say um, so equivalence preserving is in the downward direction, if, you're equ if you have equivalence of two components in the source then their compiled versions are equivalent to the target, equivalence reflection goes the other way, if two things are equivalent in the target then their uh, original versions should be equivalent in the source. Um, and when you have both technically that property is called fully abstract compilation, just so you know. Ah, yes. Uh, 
So it, it should basically be um, contextual equivalence. Have you guys talked about contextual equivalence? Not so much? You mean the semantic equivalence that I used over here? I'm going to ask you to put this question on hold until the lecture on Friday morning. Okay. Because we'll come back to this and Friday morning will be all about fully abstract compilation and I'll show you why that doesn't work. Okay? All right. It has to do with reasoning about context. Okay. All right. So, um, so often because this is sort of, you know, I've been using the word attacker for these client contexts that might do bad things. This is often referred to as secure compilation, just like semantics preserving compilation is often referred to as um, a correct compilation. Now, um, out there you'll also sometimes hear the phrase security preserving compilation. Now, sometimes this can mean that you have a security typed language, you know, that does like gives you information flow guarantees and that you somehow design type systems at the low level that also check for um, information flow guarantees. Um, and sometimes it can mean that you are actually doing more, which is preserving non-interference guarantees in those languages. But this is grayed out. I'm not going to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, all right. So today what I'd like to do is, is sort of zoom in on semantics preserving compilation, start talking about that and ta talking about different work. Um, and I'll throw in a little bit of type preserving compilation later on. Okay? All right. So let's go in. Okay. So um, now I'm talking about compiler correctness. And as I said, you know, this has been... Uh, there's been work on compiler verification going all the way back to 1967. Uh, sorry, I said a McCarthy paper, but it was McCarthy and Painter. Um, this paper called Correctness of a Compiler for Arithmetic Expression. So that was the first, you know, um, how do we verify, how do we prove that a compiler is correct? And notice, it was just a compiler for arithmetic expression, right? Um, now, if you want to see, there's a co really comprehensive bi um, bibliography out there, uh, thank due to Dave from 2003. It's like four pages long and goes from <coughs> 1967 all the way to 2003. Google it if you're interested. All right. Now, the way we talk about compiler verification these days is really we kind of go back to CompSense, right? So Le uh, Xavier Leroy's paper from 2006 um, was the first paper showing that you could verify, a, you could do a machine check proof of a reasonable subset of C uh, using a proof of system, right? And the way that CompSert works is um, the entire compiler is developed in Coq, and then you extract OCaml code out of it and run that. Um, okay, now, after that, there's been a lot of follow-up work. So there's been work on using essentially the same methodology that Xavier put forward for CompSert. Um, there's been work on verifying uh, compiler for Java threads, just-in-time compiler, a rather simple just-in-time compiler for um, x86. Um, the CompSert work has also been scaled up to this project, which is called CompSert TSO, um, which is about relaxed memory concurrency, that how do we compile C down to relaxed memory models? Uh, TSO is, uh, short, is uh, the acronym for total store ordering. Um, and this leads to interesting questions in the presence of, so CompSert does not deal with concurrency, and the, uh, this project uh, tries to, you know, basically formalize how do we reason about correctness when we have uh, weak memory models. Uh, okay, uh, and there's also been this work on Vellum or the verified LLVM where um, this paper from uh, 2013, uh, they took one of the most significant passes in the LLVM backend and uh, proved correctness of that. Um, and most recently, there's also been an ML compiler. Uh, there's a, you know, this is a very um, solid implementation called CakeML, which is a verified compiler for ML. Okay, now let's talk about why CompSert had such impact. So basically, I would say it was because um, it demonstrated that if you, um, that you can in fact build realistic verified compilers, and that this is a feasible thing and that it has benefits. So in fact, there's this quote that I'll put up from um, uh, this 2011 paper. This came out of John Regeer's group at Utah. Uh, and they basically, what they did is they built this tool called CSmith that randomly generated uh, C <coughs> programs and threw them at all the major C compiler implementations. So GCC, LLVM, CompCert, and there were others. Um, and they, f they found a lot of bugs in the existing implementations of GCC and LLVM, and some of them critical bugs. Um, but they say that the striking thing about our CompCert results is that the middle end bugs that we found in all other compilers are absent. As of early 2011, the underdevelopment version of CompSert is 
the only compiler we have tested for which CSMS cannot find wrong code errors <coughs> in its compilation. Um, this is not for lack of trying. We've devoted about 60 PU years to the task. Uh, the apparent unbreakability of CompSearch supports the strong argument that developing compiler optimizations within a proof framework has tangible benefits for compiler users. All right, so um, that was a pretty nice result to see come out, and it sort of you know, encouraged more work in the area. Um, now, I'd like to just sort of go back and dwell a little bit on this word feasible, right? Comsert was, y you need to know when Comsert was done. Comsert was done at a time when people believed this was not possible, right? This, I mean, this was an era where people were talking about type preserving compilers, but the idea that you could take an entire compiler and not just preserve types, which are, you know, some properties of uh, the, the source language programs are preserved, but actually preserve full semantics was, and do so in, you know, completely using a machine check, uh, using a proof assistant was really sort of amazing. Um, and once Avi had shown how to do it, there were other people who sort of wanted to do it. Um, but then the other thing to sort of think about is tangible benefits, right? There, you will find throughout, and you know, we'll talk about other pieces of work that this is true of, um, there are many things, big problems that the community feels, oh, that's just not feasible, right? But if it is a problem that you think, if you solve that problem, there would be huge tangible benefits to computer science, to software, to everything, all right? Then maybe it's just a question of people haven't really looked carefully enough. There's, you know, or maybe it's too much labor, but maybe the labor is justified at a later point in time. So in particular, the reason CompCert is such a big deal is, you know, before CompCert we could have said, or about 10 years ago even, we could have said, Oh, who cares about compiler errors? All software crashes sometimes. It's not a big deal, right? Most software, it's true. It's not a big deal. But now we live in the super interconnected world, right, where a lot of our systems need to be high assurance. Otherwise, they're going to get attacked, and things are going to go very, very, very wrong. It's not just an inconvenience anymore. It's much more than that. So the benefit of having fully verified software has gone through the roof. And that's what I mean by the tangible benefit, right? Given the time we live in, the tangible benefit has gone up. Just something to think about. We'll come back to it um, at the end. Okay, so let's talk about why um, so many people have followed CompCert's lead. So basically, I would say that it's because CompCert provided this proof architecture that other people could easily build on, right? So what was hard then is how do we exactly specify the compiler correctness and do a machine check proof of it, right? What are all of the different um, <coughs> things that are involved? So the two things that are really nice and, and sort of simple about CompCert are, um, that it uses, uh, it's CompSearch's um, C memory model. It uses the same memory model across all of the compiler's languages. This makes things really easy. So all the way from C down to assembly, it's using the same memory model, right? Now you can't do this for all languages, but C kind of lends itself to doing this. And that makes things much easier to deal with when you're doing a mechanized proof. And the other thing is that it does, a pr it, it proves compiler correctness using simulation. So let me talk a little bit more about that. So um, here's just you know, a picture of all of the layers of CompCert. This is from the CompCert manual in 2015, so now there might be more parts which are verified. Um, so um, there were parts that were not verified, but parsing now has been. But essentially, when we talk about the verified compiler, we talk about going from this language C light um, all the way down to uh, assembly. And there's a layer in there, RTL, which I'll come back to later when I talk about some other papers, um, which, uh, where a lot of compiler optimizations are happening. You can't read that function in lining, tail call optimization, et cetera. Okay, so the front end and back end were not verified. That's this column. And all these parts were. So, um, so a lot of people have followed this lead, but the thing that I want to talk about next is that the simplicity of this proof architecture comes at a price, all right? So let's look at what the price is. Um, basically, what CompSert gives you is a correct compilation guarantee assuming that you are compiling a whole program, okay? And this is a quote from Xavier um, in 2014, um, that the semantics preservation guarantees apply only to whole programs that have been compiled by, you know, whole programs compiled by the CompCert C compiler. Now, so I'm gonna start writing P, big P for a whole program. So I have a big P for in the source language that I'm compiling, PS in the source language that I'm compiling to PC. Okay, but in reality, do we ever really compile a whole program? Even when we think we're writing a whole program, don't you think the compiled code gets linked with other things? 
does, right? I mean, you end up, uh, in reality, we almost always compile components. And I'll write a little e for, to indicate program expressions or components, <coughs> smaller things. Um, we, compi we compile an ES to an ET. And we'll always have to link these components with some sort of low-level libraries of the runtime system or things like that. Right? So what CompSort is doing, the CompSort theorem, is saying, I am assuming that that linking does, I'm going to pretend that that linking does not happen. Right? Every theorem has to make certain assumptions. Under these conditions, such and such is true. Right? And what I want to do over um, the next couple of lectures is peel away these assumptions and say, what assumptions is every single compiler verification paper making? Are they good assumptions? Are they practical? Are they realistic? How do we do better? Right? OK, so in reality, we need to be able to link with these libraries and runtime systems. We also, <laughs> these days, build a lot of multi-language software. You'd like to be able to write part of your program in ML and then link with some C library. right? Or maybe you can write uh, some of that C code in Rust these days. right? But you'd like to be able to link these things together. So what happens? How do we reason about this situation, you know, this thing that we do with our compilers all of the time, which is we compile components and then we link them with code. That code may have been written, you know, some of it may have been hand optimized because you needed it to run fast. Um, and some of it may have been compiled by different compilers from a very different looking source language. Coming back to the question from someone earlier, you, um, right? How different languages, the different type systems, how do we kind of reason about them coming together? OK, so let's talk about why CompCert made a whole program assumption. Okay? The whole question is, if we compile a source, language, uh, a source program S to a target program T, how do we express that equivalence? The way CompCert expresses that equivalence, and this is for whole programs, is in the following way. Basically, the CompCert theorem is expressing that equivalence of a simulation. It's saying that if I have a whole source program PS and I run it, so we need to say that I'm going to see the same observable behavior as when I run the compiled program PT. And the way to, that we prove that is by using a simulation argument. So basically, you set up a relationship indicated by that red line in the middle. Think of it as a relation R between a source program and a target program. You, you say that assuming that the relationship holds in the initial state, when my, I'm going to show that when my source program takes a step, then my target program can take one or more steps and things will line up and be related by the same relation again. So in other words, running these programs preserves the relation. There, therefore, there exists a simulation. Okay? Now in reality, it's not always as simple as what I've drawn over here, that if, P, if PS at some state takes one step, then the PT takes one or more th steps and things line up again. Sometimes you want your target code to have done some optimization. So you want fewer steps to happen at the target. Right? OK, so you need to take all of those things into account, and that gets um, more technical, but I won't go into that. Um, OK, and the other reality is that CompSort consists of many different passes. So you might compile from the source language S to some intermediate language T, and then have another compiler pass that goes from T to U. OK, so think of this as two different compiler passes, S to T, T to U. All right. So what we need to show is that these per pass simulations prove, are preserved. So for every pass we, we show that there is a simulation, the first one we did it with the relation R1, the second one we do with the relation R2, and then we have to show that the compiler from S through T to U actually preserves the equivalence, which means that we need to show these simulations composed. Okay? Um, and there's also lots of things about forward and backward simulations. I, here, I've just been talking about it in terms of forward simulations, which is this property of when I run the source, the target runs and does the same thing. That's a forward simulation. But really, a lot of the time, you don't want forward simulations. Like, to just give you a simple example, um, C is a language that is not type-safe. When you run C programs at the source level, you might have errors. Do you want your compiler to preserve all the behavior of the source. You want it to preserve errors as well as good behavior. That seems a bit too much, right? So many compiler verification efforts say that, oh, we're not going to preserve errors. If your source program is going to just error, then why do you care what the target program does? OK? So things like that make it, uh, make it more sensible to prove what we call the backward simulation. <laughs> A backward simulation says that if the target program does something, 
then the source program will do the same thing. Okay? Um, and ComSearch proof is, is basically forward simulations for every single pass composed together to give you a final backward simulation. Okay, so my, my point in, in all of this information data that I'm throwing at you is to say that there are a lot of layers to be peeled and decisions to be made in terms of how exactly do we formalize this equivalence? What is the property we're proving? Forward, backward, et cetera. Um, Yeah, so, um, so the way that this works is you, what you're really tracking you, even here is in each one of these stepping arrows, there might be certain observable effects that happen. Like let's say printing, right? Or calling a file or, you know, oops, sorry. Um, or yeah, making a function call to something external, something like that. Um, and so what you're really proving is that what is preserved is, you know, you're seeing the same trace of effects in the source and the target that helps to weaken it back to the thing that we want. But thank you, that's yet another layer that you know, has to, what are the observations in the source and the observations in the target? Because at the end, we only care about those. Everything else is called an internal step and therefore ignored. Okay, so the point of, of this is, you know, ComSert is using simulations and they are closed simulations. It can, ComSert can say that I'm going to, if I run the source program, then I get the same thing as when I run the target program. But these are closed programs. They don't need to be linked <coughs> with anything. If they were not closed programs, how would you even say that I'm going to run it? Right? What does it mean to run a program <coughs> that is a component? It hasn't been linked with anything yet. Right? That's part of the problem of why it's difficult to specify correct compilation of components, which is what, what I want to talk about next. Um, so if we're just compiling a source component to a target component, how would you express this equivalence. The source component ES is equivalent to its compiled version ET. So let's think in terms of what we want, right? It should always be, what should our theorem say? Well, it should be, what do we want? <laughs> um, I would say what we want out of a compiler correctness result is that when I compile a source component to a target program, um, to a target component, then how am I going to use that? Well, at some point, someone's going to give me some other code. I'll call that ET prime, right? And I'm going to have to link with this other code. So now my question becomes, OK, so this is how I'm going to use the component that I wrote in the source language. I'm going to take its compiled version ET and link it with some code ET prime that someone gave me. Maybe it was a library. Maybe you wrote, maybe some other person in the team wrote another uh, component in some completely different language, et cetera, right? But someone gave me this compiled code, and now I need to link these two together. So my compiler correctness theorem should say something about the combined behavior of ET linked with ET prime. When I run that program that I get from linking ET and ET prime, what behavior should I see? What should it correspond to at the source level? That's the job of the compiler correctness theorem to tell me, right? Yes. Okay, so you want, so, so in my picture, you, I want to know what should ET linked with ET prime, the purple whole program that I get when I put these two puzzle pieces together. When I run that, what should that be equivalent to? Give me a statement that involves my source component, right? Or even an intuitive statement. Yes. <laughs> my question mark component. Yes, if we had some ES prime that we knew is equivalent, using the same equivalence relation, right? Now this equivalence relation is talking about components. So if, if we can say that ES equivalent to ET, uh, sorry, compiler correctness is proving that ES is equivalent to ET, and what that should mean is that if I have some ES prime, my mystery question mark component, that is equivalent to ET prime, then I could say that running the purple components linked together would be the same as running the ones at the top. 
right? That I sh what I want is to be able to see the same observable behavior when I run the top stuff as when I run the bottom stuff. Yes. You are, yes. Uh, yeah, so basically this is all about context, right? Because we're compiling components, the key word here is context. It is not a whole program. Tell me what I'm linking it with. What is the context that I'm putting it into? At the target level, we know that we're putting it into some target context. This guy, this EP prime is our context, right? And the question we run into is what is the context at the source level? And now there are many different answers to this question. And Every piece of compiler verification, you know, sorry, correct compilation of component <coughs> work that I'm going to look at formalizes this differently. All right, so let's look at some options. What ET primes should we be allowed to link with? Not are we, but should we be allowed to link with? We could say ET prime is something that was produced by the same compiler. Same compiler, the one that we're verifying. That's called separate compilation, okay? Uh, it's not the most general thing. But that, that could be one way of saying it. Another one could be ET prime was produced by a different compiler, but it was a compiler for the same source language S. I'm compiling the source language S. This other compiler that exists out there also knows how to compile the same source language S. That means that you know that other compiler compiled an ES prime, right? So it gives us our hands on an ES prime, even if it was compiled by a different compiler. That's another option. Um, we could we could get more and more general though, right? Um, Perhaps ET prime uh, was produced by a compiler for a different, com completely different source language, R. How do we deal with that? Um, I'm just going to keep getting more and more general, <laughs> you can see, right? Um, and then, you know, what if that R is very, very different from S in terms of um, type systems or something? Like, let's say one is Rust and the other one is ML. ML doesn't have any notion of memory ownership the way um, Rust does, right? Um, how do you put those two very, how do you reason about that kind of linking then? Um, and then there's this sort of meta question. When you, when you try to formalize compiler correctness, so that you say, okay, I'm happy to link with this ET prime, do you want that ET prime's behavior to be expressible in your source language S? <laughs> Remember this guy? the attacker, do we want to link with clients at the target level that can't, no matter how hard you try, cannot even be expressed in your source language? That means they're doing, they have behavior that you cannot write down in your source language. Sounds bad from a security point of view. Sounds great from a reasoning point of view. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, does not sound great from a reasoning point of view. What it sounds great for is, well, this is the reason we build multi-language software. You, you want to be able to do certain things in one language. Let's say you have a nice little domain-specific language in which, uh, which is terminating. Perhaps you use this language for writing protocol parsers. It would be nice to have a nice little you know, terminating language in which I can write protocol parsers so that I know that I never go into an infinite loop. But now I want to be able to take this uh, protocol parser and be able to link it into a larger system and all the other code in my system was not written in a terminating language. <coughs> We'd like to be able to do things like that, right? So maybe we don't always want to link with behavior that can be expressed in our perhaps sometimes impoverished languages. So we're going to talk about all of these issues over the next uh, three lectures. Yes? Couldn't that be the other way as well? Like you have terrible behavior that's expre that ah. is expressible in the component language but not the larger system language? Like you're writing something in so that is a great point. So let's talk about that. You know, everything that I keep saying <laughs> is about, uh, so whenever I say uh, how do we express compiler correctness, I am thinking about the compiler from my language. And you just br brought in this difference of perspective. What if your language is Python or your language is C, which is far worse than ML, right? And this brings up a really important point. When you are doing compiler verification for a language like C, C is happy to link with everything. Okay, so if you're doing correct component compilation for a language like C, C is happy to link with everything. You don't have to do much checking of what ET primes you can link with. Just make sure it satisfies the C memory model. But if you're writing, if you're building a verified compiler for a nice type safe language like ML, you're gonna have to do a lot more. 
or at least it seems reasonable to expect your compiler correctness theorem to give you a lot more, right? And that will, that's what we'll talk about. Like, what should we expect our compiler correctness theorems to tell us when we're compiling nice type safe languages? So, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Now, um, the key thing here, um, and right now I'm really in a should phase, all right? I'm saying what should our compiler correctness theorems guarantee for us? What should they give us? Well, I claim that if we're really going to compile components and do correctness or compilation, then that definition, however we choose to specify it, it should allow us to link with code that comes from anywhere. <coughs> Ultimate goal, all right? Comes from anywhere. Let's not care about what language it came from. Or maybe we do care about it, but, you know, um, we should be able to support code that comes from anywhere. And we, uh, in order to build realistic compilers, we have to be able to support multi-path compilation. And I put the both of these two together because we'll see that they're sort of pull in different directions, cause trade-offs. Okay. Um, so, I'm uh, going to start surveying the literature now, all right? We're going to talk about different pieces of work. Um, and uh, they're all, this is the literature on so-called compositional compiler correctness. The word compositional is used whenever we're talking about correct compilation of components. Um, and what I want to sort of dwell on, whenever we see one of these papers um, that I'm going to talk about, what I want to dwell on is this question of, we're going to look at how they specify that equivalence between source and target components, and we're going to say, um, okay, this equivalence, what is it actually allowing us to link with? And the way that it's specified, what, does it, what work does it make us do? Like, if I give you an ET prime and say, can you please go link with this? What do you have to do to check whether it's okay to link with this ET prime according to, this, to the formal statement <coughs> uh, that is the compiler correctness theorem? How do I check whether ET prime satisfies my compiler correctness theorem? Okay? Um, and this, this linking dimension is often called horizontal compositionality in the literature. You know, horizontal because we're bringing things in from that side. And um, then there's the vertical compositionality dimension, which is about how do I take, how do I verify one pass of my compiler at a time? And then at the end, I need some sort of transitivity property so that I can put together all of these per pass compiler correctness results and say, I have an end to end correctness guarantee for my whole compiler. Okay? So that dimension is called vertical compositionality. It's all about transitivity for multi pass. Um, okay, now. Um, some of the things we're going to see is, you know, I've already said this, how we specify that equivalence. Um, <coughs> it has, it constrains what we can link with, uh, how we check if some ET prime is okay to link with. Um, but something else, it, it affects the effort required to prove transitivity, as we'll see. Um, and the other thing we're going to dwell on is how much effort, if someone submitted a compiler verification paper to Paul, and you were reviewing it, you have a compiler correctness theorem somewhere in the paper. How do you check that it's the right theorem? Okay, what do you need to understand and trust in order to have confidence in the theorem statement? That's important. Okay, um, and then you know later on we'll talk about um, uh, how to support linking with code that comes from very different languages and uh, fully abstract compilation. All right, so let's dive in. Um, here's my linking line. <laughs> Okay, we are starting, we have talked about CompCert, which allows you to link with nothing. Well, this is not current CompCert, actually. This is CompCert as of a couple of years ago. Um, and we're, I'm slowly going to talk about <coughs> work that allows you to link with more and more. All right? Um, now, I said you could link with things that come from the same compiler. So one instance of that in the literature is this work on SEP CompCert for separate compilation. Uh, it basically takes CompCert and uh, <coughs> generalizes the theorem so that you get a separate compilation guarantee. As long as you compile that other ET prime with the same SEP CompCert compiler, you can put them together and you have a compiler correctness guarantee. Okay? Um, more general, how do I link with some ET prime, this other code, that came from a different compiler but was compiled from the same source language S? Okay? And I would call the Pilsner work uh, from 2015 um, an instance of that, and I'll explain why. Uh, and then, generalizing still further, I'd like to be able to co link with code that came from a different language, R. Uh, and I would say an instance of that is compositional concert, which is 
you know, more liberal than CEP concert. CEP concert says you can only link with things that were compiled, other things that were also compiled with the CEP concert compiler. Compositional concert essentially says you can link with anything that uh, satisfies the C memory model. In, in essence, it, it, it turns into all of the compi uh, compiler IRs that are sitting in the CompCert compiler. You can link with code in any one of those IRs because they also all satisfy the requirement that I have. Okay, um, and then um, I'll talk about some work that we did, which is on um, multi-language semantics for thinking about, uh, for proving compiler correctness. And here you can link with uh, code that comes from a very different language, something that cannot be expressed in your source. Okay, um, so let's talk about step concert. Any questions before I go on? No? Okay. All right. So, as I said, SEP concert. Yeah. Yes. Any intuition on why those go backwards sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> I love that you noticed. <laughs> um, that's actually a really bizarre thing. They literally go backwards in time. Um, yeah, this was uh, 2014. This was POPO 15. So it was actually earlier than that one, which was ICFP 15. So later in the year. I mean, I'm just saying those two are 15, but. <laughs> They are literally backwards. Um, <laughs> mechanized efforts that were in the pipeline come on later. No. Um, so the funny thing, if you read the SEP concert paper, which I'm just about to talk about, so this is a good time. Um, the SEP concert paper um, in the introduction says there's been all this general work <laughs> on compositional compiler correctness, and they go to all this trouble to make, let you link with all sorts of things. We'll take a much more modest goal <laughs> and show you. Um, you know how to how to take the existing concert development and in very little time scale it so that you at least get a separate compilation guarantee. Okay, so their advantage or you know the thing that they were selling is um, you know we can at least get this uh, separate compilation guarantee uh, without having to think about all the hard problems and you know this might be a sweet spot for certain compilers to be in. So I think the work that my group is doing talks a lot about expressiveness. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what you mean by comparing. Uh, certainly expressiveness, you know, since this is, so much of this is about, you know, this other code that we're linking with, is it more expressive? How, how does this expressiveness compare to the code that we can write in our own language? So in that sense, yes, all of this very much comes in. And my very last lecture on Saturday, I will talk explicitly about expressiveness, okay? Um, okay, maybe not that explicitly, but it'll come in. <laughs> it'll be very relevant that day. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, so step concert. We have the same exact compiler being used to separately compile different modules from the source to the target. And we'd like to be able to prove that when we link them all together, we get the same uh, behavior at the target level as at the source. Um, so let's just do a quick overview of what step concert does, right? Um, Basically, they have two forms of correctness that they prove. One is level A correctness, one is level B correctness. Okay, <laughs> what does level A correctness do? That's the simpler one. Basically, um, they say that if you have, if, so we have two separate components, right? Here it's written as S1C in the C language, S2C, and there's S3. Um, and then we're compiling them to some medium I, uh, dot IR and then going to assembly, right? So this is just showing you two passes. But if you are compiling your two components literally in lockstep, so every, uh, both S1 and S2 are going to go through the exact same transformation, all the way from the top to the bottom, all right? This is level A correctness. Then they're gonna tell you that yes, your compiler is correct. Okay, so end to end, what do they want? Well, it's rather simple, but it's interesting to see how it's formalized or how it's formally expressed. For all I, so for all of these components that you wanna link together, um, the compiled version of SI.C, that squiggly C is compiled version, if that gives you a target level T dot a 
assembly, ASM. Um, then we're going to say S is what we get if we load all S uh, all 1 through N S components together, and T is what we get if we link and load all of the T ones together. Okay? So take all the top ones, link them together, you get S. All the bottom ones, link them together, you get T. Then what end-to-end -end correctness should give us is that the behavior of T is in behaviors of S. Okay? All right. Backward simulation. All right, now, they need to get that end-to-end -end correctness property from per-path correctness. But that's going to be easy, right? Because they're going in lockstep. That's the advantage of saying, I'm just going to put a separate compilation, not different compilers or different languages. <coughs> so what happens here? Well, um, it's essentially the same sort of thing. Um, for all n of the modules that we want to link together, we compile them using this transformation t uh, from s to t. And then we combine all of the s ones together. We combine all of the t ones together to get um, the linked and loaded versions, and then we get the same thing. So basically, um, you very easily get end-to-end -end correctness from per-path correctness. There's really nothing terribly difficult going on because everything is in lockstep. Now, they also wanted to relax this a little bit because sometimes you might want to use the ComSort compiler and leave out a few optimizations. Yeah. <laughs> ah, OK. So. Let's think of that as if I run the behave t and behave s should be thought of as follows. If I take this uh, program s, which is the linked and loaded version of my source, and then I run it using my source operational semantics, what behaviors do I see? That's the set behave s. And similarly for t. Okay? So the assumption here is take that t, which is the whole program that we get after putting all of the components together, and run it using the target language's operational semantics and see what behaviors are visible. Okay. And again, those might be things like printing, final values produced, et cetera. OK. Um, all right. Now, sometimes you might want to run the ComSort compiler without doing all, you know, leaving out certain optimizations. OK? So they wanted to support a slightly stronger theorem as well. And that's what level B correctness is about. Um, basically, it says that, you remember that RTL pass, RTL is one of the intermediate languages in the ComSort compiler, and I showed you that there were a whole bunch of optimizations happening within that language. Um, and so level B correctness basically says, how do we leave out some of these optimizations? Uh, and this is sort of interesting because, so, so here you can see, you know, we're going to do certain transformations for some, on some components, but not on others. Um, and the way that the end-to-end -end correctness is, is pretty much what it was before, if we have a whole bunch of 1 through n modules that we compile from source to target, we, when we load them, we, the behavior of t should be a subset of the behavior of s. Um, but the per path, of course, is going to be different, right? Because some passes are doing some of these RTL optimizations, and some of them aren't. And by the way, both, all the modules are being compiled through the same passes all the way down to RTL. It's just that when we get to that RTL phase, one, you know, one module might be compiled without certain optimizations, while the other one might be compiled with. That's the only place where we, can, we are allowed to have a mismatch. Okay? Um, and here, basically, what they do is they say that if um, in the per-pass phase, this is only for RTL, um, if we link together, so you see if S is equal to the load of, I have a bunch of U1 through UMs, and then I have one S. Notice how I'm using exactly the same, I'm keeping all the modules the same, except for one. Right? So you're in an RTL pass. You have all of these components. One of them is going to potentially use the optimization. All the others are going to be identity transformations. If that is the case, then they prove that behavior of T is a subset of behavior of S. OK, so this is what they're doing for every single one of those optimizations in the RTL pass. And with this restriction, they basically get a transitivity property, which lets them go from per path correctness to end to end correctness. OK? Sorry, this is getting a bit dry. <laughs> but um, OK. Any questions on any of that? Yeah. So is the reason Um, so, so the way we say it is <coughs> every behavior of T 
should be a valid behavior of S. Now, that almost sounds like the opposite of semantics preservation, right? Where I was saying, if S behaves in a certain way, then T should behave in the same way. But, but it ha the problems creep in um, when you start to talk about whether or not your languages are non-deterministic. Okay, so if your, um, let's say your source language is non-deterministic, that means that source language can have many different behaviors. So that means that when you compile, you only want to preserve one of those behaviors, right? Right? Source language is non-deterministic. When you run that source program, you can see a whole bunch of different behaviors. Which one is your compiler promising to preserve? Can't preserve all of them in one run, right? Okay, so that's why we sort of want the backward notion. We want to say, all right, source program has a bunch of behaviors. Target program has a bunch of behaviors. Let's say that's also non-deterministic. <coughs> so when we take that compiled target program and we run it, we see a behavior. Is this one behavior out of many, because my target is non-deterministic, is this one behavior that I just saw one of the possible behaviors that my source allowed? <coughs> Makes sense, right, when you say it that way? But it has to do with non-determinism. That's why we get the subset relationship in that direction. Okay? And so it always depends what compiler, your, the compiler that you're verifying, what are your languages? Are they deterministic or non-deterministic? CompCert, by the way, uh, that shows that the target language is deterministic, um, and the source has a technical property called receptor, which I won't go into. Yeah? Um, what about stuff like, you know, actions by the garbage collector, like something that's necessarily a part of the garbage collector when you dismiss it all, so they just like completely ignored? <laughs> Um, so, okay, CompStar doesn't have to deal with that because we're at C, so no garbage collection. But, uh, but yes, uh, that's a great question to ask for um, compiler verification efforts for things where there, are, where there is garbage collection. And right now the answer is it's ignored. Okay. Um, all right. So, that was separate compilation, right? Um, which is compositional compiler correctness, but it's the weakest form of it. So now I want to talk about... Um, I don't immediately want to dive on into this work on Pilsner, uh, but I want to talk about this idea of sort of more compositionality. Um, I'd like to be able to link with code that was compiled from the same language S, but possibly by produced by a different compiler than the one that I'm verifying. All right, now, um, before I dive into Pilsner, you have to understand what happened before that. <laughs> um, so, Really what, what I'm going to talk about now is this idea of we could specify compiler correctness as follows. We could say that I am going to sit down and write down a cross-language relation. And this relation is going to serve as a compiler correctness specification because it is going to be the definitive word on when source programs, components, are equivalent to certain target programs. Okay. You guys have seen logical relations for proving, uh, for proving strong normalization, I assume. And I, I, was, I just found out that you didn't actually see logical relations used for equivalence much. OK, so maybe we have to fix that <laughs> before we go further. But basically, the same kind of logical relation that you guys saw being used to prove um, strong normalization for the simply typed lambda calculus, you can scale that up into what we call a binary relation, where you talk about not just one program having a certain property, but two different programs ha being, having some sort of relationship. In this particular case, the relationship we want is equivalent. Okay? So logical relations, these binary logical relations, which talk about two programs having a property, um, are often <coughs> used to prove equivalence of programs. Okay? Um, and here I'm generalizing that just one step further and saying that we could write one of these logical relations, these binary logical relations, um, but instead of saying, uh, instead of specifying a logical relation which says one prog, you know, an expression in, source in language S is equivalent to another expression in language S, I'm going to say, oh, I, I'm allowed to put a different language on one side. So I'm going to create a relation between source language programs and target language programs. That's why I'm calling it a cross language relation. All right, now, the background is um, that um, before this work on Pilsner, the reason I put the Pilsner work on my linking line um, is because Pilsner is a multi-pass compiler, okay? And it uses this sort of cross-language relation idea. You specify compiler correctness by specifying a relationship between source and target components. Um, 
but it was preceded by work um, on single path compilers that made use of logical relations um, to prove correctness in this way. And what I would like to do next, what time do I have to stop? <laughs> <laughs> Did I start at 1040, 1045? Yeah. 1040? Before two. Before two. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take about 15 more minutes. I think I started at 1040, 45. Um, so let's see how far we get. Um, OK, so I would like to cover um, typed closure conversion. Right? So this is going to be my digression into showing you one simple compiler path and showing how we formalize uh, type preservation, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to, tomorrow, it won't happen today, um, then tomorrow I'll take that type closure conversion path and go and show you how we use one of these cross-language logical relations <coughs> in order to prove correctness of that compiler transformation, of closure conversion, okay? Um, and this is just going to be a small, simple example, but it should be enough to give you a sense of, you know, how these proofs go or what the general idea is. Okay, so let me, are you guys feeling awake enough? Yes? Pre-lunch slot. Not so good. Um, all right. Let's do... Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to take very simple language, the simply typed lambda calculus, right? And we're going to do this path called closure conversion. So let me start out by talking about what closure conversion is about. Um, basically the idea is that you, let's say we're compiling an ML-like language, simply typed lambda calculus, right? So what you want to be able to do <coughs> is take any function that you have in your program and turn them into closed codes. Basically, you don't want there to be any free variables in the body of the function. So let me give you an example. Suppose that I have something like um, So this function, how many free variables does it have? Two, right. So the reason this function is probably fine sitting in the middle of your ML code or your simply type lambda calculus code is because further up, you have some sort of let y equals that and let w equals something else. Um, and then you eventually get down to this, right? So these free variables are bound somewhere. But imagine what you're going to do as you write your compiler. You need to, at some point, take all of your functions, functions like this one, and you need, you need to going to produce code, right? You're going to need to produce addition instructions and so on that are essentially doing what this function is doing. So the way a compiler is structured is right now we'd like to be able to do closure conversion. In other words, um, figure out where these, you know, turn all functions into closed codes so that then we can take all of those closed functions and lift them up to top level. That's called hoisting. And once we've lifted them up to top level, which means what all we're trying to do is just get rid of the scoping dependency, right? Right now, this function only makes sense because it's, it's sitting in the middle of some let. And when we go to low level code, we're gonna lose scope. <coughs> we can't keep it. So we're gonna close it, we're gonna hoist it up to top level. Once we've hoisted it up to top level, we can take that function and allocate it on the heap and then do code generation. Allocating on the heap means it's a separate unit. It doesn't depend on scope, okay? That's the reason we do things like closure conversion. All right, so I want to take this piece of code and convert it into closed code. And the way that we do that <coughs> is we basically take the function and we transform it into a pair called a closure, which is a pair of code and some environment. All right, so, uh, but we're going to structure it so that the, 
we take this code and we pass its environment in as an explicit argument. So I'm going to say that I'm going to turn this function into code that takes some z, which, I'm, which has some environment type, which we'll get to in a second. And then it takes its normal argument, which is x colon is. All right? Yes? They're free in that scope, but they should be bound, exactly. Yeah. So you're trying to make the environment explicit, basically. Right. You can nest the lambda condition also. Nest the lambda. Uh, so if you could have this lambda x is x plus y plus w uh -huh. as part of one gigantic uh, term, uh, which is uh, the scope is but does the lambda. So it could be nested inside any sort of where y and w are defined. Uh, do you have nested lambdas then? But I want every single lambda to have a close, to have no free variables. The lamb, the body of any lambda anywhere in my program must have no free variables. That's where I'm trying to get to, or that's what this path is going to get. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. So that's the key thing. Every single lambda that we end up with after this path must have no free variables in its body. OK, so um, actually, before I, before I even do this, um, show you the code, let's just identify what is in the environment. The environment, so this is going to be the code. This is going to be the environment. The environment is essentially these two things. If we could keep track of what the value of y is and what the value of w is, that gives us our environment. Um, now, what I'm saying here is I'm going to take the function and convert it into some code that takes its environment as an explicit argument. Right? And then here, in the body, I'm going to transform the body so that all references to the formerly free variable are now references to the same things which I'm going to pull out of the environment. Okay? So we're going to transform this into x plus y. Well, the y should be sitting there in the first component of the environment. So I'm just going to project do pi 1 of out of the environment. Okay? And to get w, I'm going to project the second thing out of the environment. Okay? Now, I have code and I have an environment. In order to create a closure, I pair them up together. So here's the closure I would produce for this particular function. And that's a pair or a tuple. Okay? Right. Um, now, here's the situation I'd like you to pay attention to. Um, here we have a function. What is the type of this function? Have I told you enough to, for you to figure out the type of the function? Depends? Hmm? Now let's assume that y and that this is all well typed, and therefore we know that here in some gamma, y is an int and w is an int. Right? Okay, so clearly it's an int to int function. All right, let me give you another int to int function. How many free variables does that have? How many free variables does it have? Zero. X is bound. X is bound right here. That's not a free variable. Right? So it has zero free variables. All right, let's produce the code and environment for that. The code is going to be tau n. That was easy. And what's the environment going to be? <laughs> Nothing. Everything. Right? So, so when we produce our code and environment pair for that, we, we get an empty environment there. Now, here's the next exercise. Um, we are transforming two int arrow int functions. They are both, we are performing closure conversion on both of them. I would like us to check what is the type of the code environment pair that we are producing. What is the type of this code environment pair? Let's write it down. The code part is, well, we didn't say what tn is. What is tn here? It's a 
equal of two integers. Right? This is what Tn is. What is Tn here? Empty tuple algebra like that. Right? Okay, so now that you know that, help me figure out what the type of this is, and then we'll figure out what the type of that is. The type of this is a pair of two things, the first of which is a function, a function that takes tau n uh, should I write tau n? I'll write tau n. Okay. Um, and the second is int and then it produces an int. Right? And that is paired with the actual environment which is of type int paired with int. But I'll write tau n again. What is the type of that? Well, by the way, tau n is int paired with int. Very important, right? In both of these. What is the type of this? This time tau n is empty, right? So it's empty int to int paired with empty. How do these two compare? Are they the same type? No. OK. Hmm? <laughs> exactly. Right. And that is the key to, to, to the typed closure conversion. Basically, if you want to preserve types through this path, it's nonsense for us to take two functions, two different functions of type int to int, and turn them into two different functions whose types don't match. Right? That, basically, that would be very bad. What's happening is, if we, if we assign this type to the first function and that one to the second, then we've revealed in the type that this one has two free variables, whereas that one does not. Right? And information about how many free variables a function has is not relevant, so we need to hide it. So we can abstract, using an existential type, we can abstract over this, this tau n and hide it. <coughs> so basically, what we're going to do is we are going to assign both of these the type there exists an alpha, which is the environment type, such that um, we are going to produce a function that first takes something of environment type, then takes an integer, produces an int, and pair that up with the environment, which is, again, the type alpha n. So basically, everywhere that I had tau n, that was the similarity between them, right? And we are going to hide what tau n is. This is very much like hiding whether a stack is implemented, it's represented as an array or a linked list, right? Here we're hiding what is the environment. So using existential types to do that. So this trick of how to do type closure conversion properly, so that you can hide that difference, um, is due to um, Minamide, Harper, Marset. Uh, it was a paper from uh, Pobble 96. Okay. Um, so let's actually do this compiler transformation for a proper language. My source language is just going to be simply type lambda calculus with um, integers. Sigma, my language is types. I can have integers and I can have functions. Okay? Um, now let me tell you what the values and expressions in the language are. So variables, numbers, lambdas. And applications, sorry, that is most certainly not a value form. <laughs> um, expressions are all of my values. And uh, for integers, let's give ourselves an if zero instruction. So we can test if an expression E is zero. If it is zero, we'll do E1. Otherwise, we go to the else branch, which is E2. And then we need application. E1 is my E1. Okay? That's my source branch. Very simple. Um, 
Now, what do we need in our target language? By the way, does this have another calculus? So just to write down, you know, our I'm going to be able to type check using judgments of this form, but I won't write down any of the typing rules. I trust you know them. Um, and we'll assume this is a call by value language. Did you guys cover evaluation context and things like that? The first thing? Okay, good. All right, so we're just going to assume that this is a call by value language and the operational semantics is specified in the normal way. Now, how about the target? <laughs> Readable? Red? Sort of. Oh. <laughs> All right. What types do we need in the target language? There's a hint over here. Can I just put int and function? Not really. I need products. <coughs> I need at least tuples, right? What else do I need? Right. So I need, and I'm going to give myself a multi-argument function. We have tuples, which I'll write in the angle brackets. And then we need existential types. Are you guys fairly comfortable with existential types and typing rules for pack and unpack? Yes? Yes? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so what are the values in the language? Well, we have x, variables, numbers, <coughs> multi argument lambdas. I'll write it in vector notation. And value tuples. This question is last right in here. Um, values if zero is e one two. Multi argument application. So we write it as e applied to a vector of arguments or several arguments. Um, we have tuples. Projection from tuples, which I'll just write as project the ith element from some uh, expression e. Uh, and then, of course, we need pack and unpack. Oh, I didn't write down the pack value form. So we will need pack um, tau v as exists how, but I'm also going to, since I structured it this way, I'll also need to give myself expressions. Right? Uh, and then finally, we need unpack. So we want to be able to unpack a package and bind its components to a type variable alpha and a term variable x. So unpack E1, bind it to these in E2. Right? And you're familiar with the operational semantics for an unpack, right? Do you want me to show it quickly? Yes, please. Yes, please? OK. So whenever we have a pack, this is not yet a value form. So we would evaluate this expression down to a value. Once it is a value, we have a pack value, right? So when we try to, so in other words, whenever you have an unpack <coughs> E1 in E2, First, you evaluate in this position and get this down to a value, which will be, which assuming it's well typed, will be a pack. And then I'm going to show you the beta, the, the, the single reduction rule. So if I try to unpack alpha x equals, in place of the e1, I'm going to assume that you've evaluated e1 down to a value and you have a pack. I'll leave off the exist alpha tau. It's just in E2. The way that this takes a step is you extract the tau and you bind it to alpha. 
and you extract the value and you bind it to x and then you substitute in this instance because E2 is allowed to have alpha and x freedom. Anyway. Okay? All right. Okay. So, um, now we have type variables in this language, so the judgment is going to have to involve a type environment. So I'm going to say delta is uh, an environment where we keep all of our type variables. So it can be a form either empty or a bunch of alphas in it. And of course, gamma is going to be the usual <coughs> term environment. So I gamma colon tau. Okay. And our typing judgments are going to have the form delta gamma e colon tau. Right? And again, I won't go into that because I assume you've seen pack and unpack rules, which are the sort of new interesting thing. All right, so this is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> um, all right, let's write down the closure conversion translation. We're going to take the expressions in the source language and convert them into the target. Right. Um, now, the key thing over here is that we have to first, let's first pin down what our type translation is, because then we have a uniform structure. We know what we're doing. So we want to take all things of type, source type sigma, and turn them into some sort of a translated type. Okay? Now, how, what do we want to do? So we're going to define a type translation. We're going to do this inductively on the structure of type. What are the types in our language? int and sigma 1 arrow sigma 2. So we're going to have two cases. So when we transform an int, when we closure convert it, you don't have to do anything. Closure conversion doesn't do anything to any of the, uh, the code in your program that is not a function or application. Closure conversion only deals with functions and applications. Everything else is essentially an identity transformation. So if you have an integer in your source, I'm just going to produce an integer in the target. Um, now, if we have a function, sigma 1 arrow sigma 2, in the source, how do we transform that? That's, oh, I erased the existential thing. <laughs> That's what we created. How do I transform a function? There exists an environment variable. I'll just put the end here to remind us. That's what it represents, the type of the environment. And then? Now we're going to have a tuple. It's going to have two things in it. First thing's going to be a function <coughs> that takes. <coughs> first it takes the alpha, the environment, and then it takes the translation of sigma 1. Uh, this shouldn't be angled, so it should be round. OK. And gives us back. And what is that? Translation of sigma 2. OK. Um, now, that's the code part. And now, what do we put here? The environment. OK, so that's our type. All right, so now that we have that, we can start uh, translating expressions in our language, in our source language, into closure converted expressions in the target. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to do it by induction on typing derivation. Right? So for every single construct in that language, we're going to produce the appropriate. So let's just, uh, well, let's talk about the overall form. <coughs> Basically, we are going to take a well-typed E colon sigma and compile it, closure converted, into some E target level. right? And this target level E, when we are done, what we want to show, so this is, this is what we're doing. This is our compiler, our type preserving compiler. But when we are done, what we want to show, we want to show that types are preserved. So we want to show that this ET has a certain type. And in particular, we are going to want to show that in the empty delta environment and in the translation of the gamma environment, which we haven't done yet, but we'll do in a second, um, ET, the translated code, has type 
What type should it have? Translation type. Okay, that's what we're after. That's what we want to show. So in fact, we want, we're going to try to do the translation so that this is always true. It's going to help us write down the translation. Um, but technically, this part will be a lemma we prove after we have actually given the translation. Uh, okay, so I said that we didn't talk about what gamma plus is, so let's define it. It's easy. You take an empty environment and you turn it into an empty environment. Uh, you take a non-empty, sorry, sigma, and you plus it into a gamma plus paired with, I'll write it as a red variable of type, of translation type. Right? So it's just the obvious thing. Take your variable, <coughs> give them translation types. Okay, now, um, yeah, I'm thinking maybe I should stop here. <laughs> I have gone over <laughs> enough. We'll continue from here tomorrow. Um, we'll finish off the type translation and then we'll um, talk about a logical relation for proving correctness of this task. Okay.